Welcome everyone to Too Good to Be True. Thank you for taking the time to listen. The subject of today's show is famous hauntings. Before we start getting into details, let's just briefly talk about psychic insight and how we apply it. We choose a subject and research it, and based on that research, we determine what we think needs to be explained by creating a series of questions. Then Justina provides psychic insight to answer those questions. The psychic insight is narrated towards the end of the show. Accepting this psychic insight is a question of individual belief. Now let's go through the disclaimers. Here are the disclaimers. Neither of us claim to have any expertise in any subjects that we discuss. We relate information we find through research and the psychic insight. We are always delighted to hear from the listeners. The show only lasts an hour. We don't have the time to present exhaustive research on any topic. This means that there will be information that we miss. We want to provide a basis for the psychic insight. We don't care if a theory turns out too good to be true, as the show name suggests. We are only interested in finding out more of the truth about topics. Spirit can only relate insight that is appropriate for our time in history. Free will cannot be affected. Only comments that are appropriate for our time can be given through the psychic insight. Much of the subject matter and shows may have already been covered many times in other media. We want to look into subjects in a new, different way and be thought-provoking. We are not so good with pronouncing names. We apologize. And neither of us have any experience of investigating ghosts or hauntings. If we have misstated anything, we apologize. Today's subject is famous hauntings. It was your suggestion. There seemed to be a lot to choose from, especially in the British Isles, where a ghost in an old house seems to be normal and not questioned. There are lots of alleged famous hauntings in the United States as well. I wonder how many are just stories. Let's start with a tourist attraction with a British uh, connection. The ocean liner Queen Mary moored in Long Beach, California. They advertise ghost tours on the Queen Mary website. The Queen Mary has being allegedly haunted is no big secret. The ship has been closed for upgrades since May of 2016, but is open for ghost tours. If you set the expectation that there are ghosts and people believe that there are going to be experienced strange happenings, why be too surprised when something unexplainable occurs? I don't know anything about psychology, but that sounds like it is possible to believe that ghosts are present when it's all in the mind. I saw the line of Queen Mary once on a school trip docked in Southampton. I think she was going to be going out of service at the time. She had three gigantic con- funnels and generally looked to be enormous. Later, I saw the liner and cruise ship, the SS Norway, originally the SS France. Like most ships, she ended up being scrapped. That raises a good point. What happens to a ghost on board a ship that is scrapped or sunk? We will save that thought for later. But why don't you describe the alleged ghost residing in the Queen Mary? There is a book, Ghosts of the Queen Mary, published in 2014. that covers the alleged hauntings. Obviously, being a book, there must be plenty of stories to relate. I will quote from the website Crixio from an article written by Adam Mock. Quote, Today's stories of ghost encounters aboard the Queen Mary are as numerous as our guests. Reportedly, dark shadows appear, ghostly apparitions visit at night, the scent of cigar smoke floods an empty room, invisible children laugh in, a vac- in vacant halls, and the spirit of little girls play in non-operational first class sw- in the non-operational first class swimming pool these accounts are parts of a bigger picture that bring the rich history and lore of the queen mary front and center to ghost lovers everywhere my wife and i hope to stay in the most haunted room possible but ask an employee which room is the most haunted and you'll be met with the same response the entire ship is haunted Regardless which room you're in, you have an equal chance to wake at night with a spectral stranger standing at the foot of your bed. During the check-in process, I found myself looking around, hoping to catch a glimpse of something out of the ordinary. No such luck, but while my wife and I waited, an employee at the counter did a double take and said he saw a shadowy figure walk in front of him. He paused and looked around before saying, that is the first time I've actually seen something, unquote. The article continues. It's generally agreed that the most haunted level to stay on is B-deck. Fortunately, the front desk made sure our room was on this floor. We thought maybe we'd be lucky enough to hear the footsteps of spectral children or catch a glimpse of passengers from times gone by. 
If ghosts did take a stroll, they did so in the comfort of slippers. Unfortunately, the only activity found we found was a large number of people allowed on the ship for free after 3 p.m., unquote. Apparently, the most haunted places are room B340 and a swimming pool. Room B340 has a story of a violent murder occurring there. There have been reports of lights turning on and off on their own and sheets being pulled off beds with occupants being disturbed in their sleep. An angry voice commanding occupants to get out is another story. The first class swimming pool, now of course drained of water, has stories of sounds of girls singing, giggling and taunting visitors. The second class swimming pool was the supposed site of a drowning, but as it now doesn't exist, the first class swimming pool is believed by some to be visited by a ghost of a five-year-old girl called Jackie. Here's a further quote from the same article. Quote, Sometimes guests have heard water splashing, even though the pool remains dry. Other times people have seen dark apparitions or the full appearance of a woman dressed in 1930s swimwear. Some have even reported wet footprints around the pool. For a while, the pool stories and sightings were so numerous that a live video feed streamed online so internet visitors could catch the activity from the comfort of home, unquote. Before we move on to the next story, we had better define what is believed to be a ghost. I think that people who believe they have seen a ghost or a ghostly manifestation have a pretty good idea what a ghost looks like. I have never seen a ghost, so I need a better idea. I think it's something that looks like a person but isn't solid and can pass through solid objects like walls. Also, the ghosts will have clothes that are from their time in history. But the reports from the Queen Mary we have discussed so far have not involved too many ghostly apparitions. It seems that different ghosts can behave in different ways. To define what a ghost can be, I will quote from Wikipedia. Descriptions of ghosts vary widely from an invisible presence to translucent or barely visible whiskey shapes to realistic lifelike visions. The deliberate attempt to contact the spirit of the deceased person is known as ne- necromancy or in spiritual as a seance. The belief in the existence of an afterlife, as well as manifestations of the spirits of the dead, is widespread. Dating back to amiism or ancient or ancestor worship in pre-literate cultures, certain religious practices, funeral rites, exorcisms, and some practices of spiritualism and ritual magic are specifically designed to rest the spirits of the dead. Ghosts are generally described as solitary, human-like essences. Those stories of ghostly armies and ghosts of animals, rather than humans, have also been recounted. They are believed to haunt particular locations, objects, or people they were associated with in life. The overwhelming consensus of science is that ghosts do not exist. Their existence is impossible to falsify, and ghost hunting has been classified as a pseudoscience. Despite centuries of investigation, there is no scientific evidence that any location is inhabited by spirits of the dead. I have to ask how the scientific method could be applied to proving that ghosts exist, There's nothing that would be directly physical that could be measured to be provided as data. If that were not the case, then a ghost would be a physical entity and therefore not a ghost. I understand there have been photographs, sound recordings, changes in temperatures and changes in electromagnetic fields and other measurements. But all of those involve the assumption that a ghost or a ghost created those effects. The right sort of data is needed to provide proof of a theory. General acceptance of a theory requires the ability to repeat an experiment to provide similar data. Surely you can't control a ghost. That raises an interesting point. What is the free will of a ghost? Presumably by being a ghost rather than a soul that has passed could demonstrate some free will. I think the takeaway is that occurrences reported for the Queen Mary fit into the category of ghostly behavior. If you believe in ghosts, you will probably believe that there are ghosts on board. But I would like to move on to reports of a ghost back in Britain that that some believe is of Anne Boleyn. I am sure you'd be delighted to talk about her life as the second wife of Henry VIII. Before talking about Anne, I have to recommend the 1966 Oscar-winning movie A Man for All Seasons that cover events surrounding King Henry VIII and his counselor Thomas More in Tudor, England, from 1529 to 1535. At the start of the movie, Henry is married to Catherine of Aragon, 
and then marries Anne Boleyn. Anne was executed on May the 15th, 1536, within the walls of the Tower of London. The charges were adultery, incest, and conspiring the king's death. Most believe that Henry VIII got the charges trumped up just to get rid of her after three years of marriage without a male heir. Some believe that Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's chief minister, created the charges. Cromwell is a major character in the movie in encouraging Henry VIII to break away from the Catholic Church. Later, Anne Boleyn's daughter was to become Queen Elizabeth I. Not being male didn't seem to inhibit Elizabeth's influence or authority. But what about the alleged ghost? Anne Boleyn's ghost, if real, seems to be able to go where it wants. There are claimed ghostly experiences in various locations, including the Tower of London, also known as the Bloody Tower. What has been reported for the Bloody Tower? We'll have to continue talking about Anne Boleyn and what the actual Bloody Tower reports are after this short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xcbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Gwilda Wiaka's latest book, The Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is the first book in a series based on her writings that open every episode of the Science of Magic radio show. Drawing on the subject matter of each guest, and armed with over 40 years' experience in shamanism, 35 years in alternative health, and degrees in psychology and religious studies, Wilda introduces relevant and leading-edge information that supports spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Rich with wisdom and inspirational quotes packaged in digestible segments, this is a book that will pull you from cover to cover. It will also serve as a daily inspirational reading for years to come. The Science of Magic Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is available at our website, tsompublications.com, amazon.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Back in Victorian England, a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle. Why are the two top personalities in the Bible tagged with the numbers 7 and 11? Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the X Zone, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible and what might they do next? Find out more, X Zone Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk. Welcome 
Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were talking about Anne Boleyn's ghost. And Dad, you were asking what has been reported for the Bloody Tower, which is also known as the Tower of London. I will quote from the website on the Tudor Trail. Perhaps the most spectacular ghost story relating to Anne is that of a captain of the guard who saw a light flickering in the locked Chapel Royale late one night. He tried to uncover the source of the light by climbing up a ladder and was met with an unbelievable scene unfolding inside. A procession of knights and ladies dressed in ancient costumes pacing the chapel. Their leader, an elegant female whose face he could not see, but whose figure resembled that of Anne Boleyn's in portraits he had seen. The procession later disappears. Anne is also said to walk from the Queen's house to the chapel of St. Peter and Vicula, where she walks down the aisle to her grave under the altar. In 1864, a soldier on duty near the lieutenant's lodgings made another sighting of Anne's ghost. He claimed to have confronted and challenged a white figure, and when his challenge met no response, he plunged his bayonet into the figure. To his complete shock, the weapon did not meet flesh, instead went straight through the woman. According to the traditional story, an officer lodged in the bloody tower saw the whole event take place from his window. The Queen's House and the Chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula are both within the grounds of the Tower of London. Anne Boleyn's grave was in, the, was in the chapel, but might have been disturbed in 1876 when repairs were made. What are the other stories? From the same website on the Tudor Trail, here are the other stories. Anne Boleyn has been seen standing at the window in the Dean's Cloister at Windsor Castle. Another Windsor ghost story claims that Anne Boleyn has been seen running down a corridor screaming, sometimes clutching her head. Anne's ghost has been seen at Hampton Court wearing a blue or black dress. Some accounts claim she is headless during these manifestations. Those last two, two stories seem pretty vague. No eyewitnesses are mentioned. I'm going to move on to ghost stories from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. That's the site of the famous American Civil War battle. Please give some background, but remember the subject we are discussing is famous hauntings, not the American Civil War. I'll keep it short. Here's a count of the battle from Wikipedia. Quote, the Battle of Gettysburg was fought July the 1st through the 3rd, 1863, in and around the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, by Union and Confederate forces during the American Civil War. The battle involved the largest number of casualties of the entire war and is often described as the war's turning point. Union Major General George Meade's Army of the Potomac defeated attacks by Confederate General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, halting Lee's invasion of the North, unquote. There were between 46,000 and 51,000 casualties. What hauntings have been reported? Quite a lot. We only have time to mention a couple of stories. Let's start with an occurrence from the website ThoughtCo that occurred at Little Round Top, a rocky hill south of the borough of Gettysburg. Quote, Civil War battles have been the subject of many motion pictures, but one of the best and most moving was 1993's Gettysburg. During the filming of that movie, much of which was done right on location at the actual battlefields, some of the participants had, a, had an unexplained encounter. Because the film required so many extras to serve as soldiers, the production hired reenactors to portray the Union and Confederate armies. During a break in filming one day, several of the extras were resting at, at Little Round Top and admiring the setting sun. They were approached by a grizzled old man whom they described as wearing a ragged and scorched Union uniform and smelling of sulfur gunpowder. He talked to them about how furious the battle was as he passed around spare rounds of ammunition then went on his way. At first, the extras assumed he was part of the production company, but their minds changed when they looked closely at the ammunition he gave them. They took the rounds to the man in charge and given out such props to the movie, and he said that they did not come from him. It turns out the ammunition from the strange old man were genuine musket rounds from that period. Unquote. I wonder how solid objects like ammunition could be moved forward in time from 1863 to 1993. I think the story takes some believing. The grizzled old man in a Union uniform would suggest that the soldiers at the time were not just younger men. Yes, it's pretty obvious that you would need to be strong and fit to be an effective soldier marching with gear for miles and fighting in a battle. 
However, the history of the civil war includes the elderly joining in because they thought so strongly about the cause of either side. Here's another ghost story. I will quote again from the Thought Co. website. Quote, constructed in 1854 and originally known as Salt's Bridge, this 100-foot expanse over a creek not far from the battlefield has also has its share of ghost encounters. A group of paranormal investigators ventured out to Salt's Bridge to see if they could get interesting photos or recordings. While they were there, a strange fog filled the air and the group saw lights from across the field. Then they heard sounds of neighing horses and cannon fire, which lasted for over 20 minutes. As the last cannon fired, the fog lifted. The group left the bridge, but seven returned later that night, thinking they would bring more to experience. The experience got even more terrifying. They saw shadow people darting by and heard men's voices. When they heard growling and the sounds of battle, they finally left, unquote. That sounds like it could be more like some kind of imprint rather than a haunting. How would a whole bunch of ghosts cooperate to keep a battle going? Before we move on, I wonder why there are so many ghost stories surrounding the Battle of Gettysburg while other battles don't seem to have as many hauntings associated with them. I don't know, but there are stories of people who have, been, who have taken rocks as souvenirs from the battlefield and have later returned them to the National Parks Commission as the area is now a national park. Apparently, unfortunate events have occurred in people's lives after the rocks have been taken. We haven't talked about ghosts appearing in photographs. There was one reported very recently. I suppose that a photograph published in national newspapers and on the internet could be described as being of a famous haunting. The photograph was taken in Scotland last summer and began being reported in the British press on the 19th of January of this year. Nothing ever seems to be ordinary when we talk about Scotland, but what happened? Group photos of 10 women were taken with Loch Eck, spelt E-C-K, in the background. Loch Eck is about 30 miles or 50 kilometres or so northwest of Glasgow as a crow flies, or about 70 miles or 110 kilometres by road. They were on a trip to give a friend a send-off into married life. So what was in the photograph? The 10 women in two rows with a second row standing on flat logs used as a bench. In the photograph, there's a young boy to the bottom left, left of the group, stooping with his hands on a flat log. Could it have been a real boy or a double exposure? They only saw the boy in the photograph, not at the time, and I think digital photography should be no double exposures. The picture apparently rather shocked the 10 women. Was the boy in the picture just a random occurrence? Apparently there was a boy who drowned in Loch Eck and his ghost lingers in the area. He was staying with his mother locally when the accident happened. The, the hotel nearby says that there is a presence that, it, that can be felt in room four. Wet footprints appear in hallways with the boy apparently looking for his mother. When did the accidental, accidental drowning happen? No one seems to know. Looking at the picture of the boy who looks to be seven or eight or maybe younger, you can only see his head, hands and his jacket. The jacket looks old fashioned. I have no idea from its appearance when it was made. If nobody knows what when it happened, it was probably a long time ago. There is always the possibility that somebody photoshopped the picture as a prank. Apparently looked at their pictures at the time of their visit and left without time for some creative editing. What other famous apparitions have appeared in pictures but on old-fashioned film? There is the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall. The famous photograph was taken professionally for the magazine Country Life. I will quote from the website The Paranormal Guide. Quote, In 1936, Captain Hubert C. Provan was taking photos of the picturesque Raynham Hall, a country house in North England, when he snapped this picture. As Provan was setting up at the shot, his assistant called out for the photo to be taken now as something was descending the staircase. The result is this world-famous photo said to be that of Lady Dorothy Walpole, unquote. The quote continues, The ghost is better known as the Brown Lady, as the spectre has been described as wearing a brown silk brocade dress. Brocade is the rich fabric, often silk, woven with a raised pather- pattern, typically with gold or silver thread. When did this happen? I think the article, it said uh, 1936, but thanks for telling me what brocade is. I I didn't have a clue. 
Um, looking at the picture, it looks like a religious statue superimposed on an old large staircase. I think that the clothing looks more Middle Eastern than English. Uh, the photograph is on multiple websites and is very easy to find. Has the ghost in the picture actually been identified? And what were the events leading up to her death? It is believed to be uh, of Lady Dorothy Townsend's w- wife of Lord Charles Townsend. Her husband was supposed to have had a violent temper. Apparently he got angry with her and locked her away in their home, Raynham Hall. She was unable to see her children and died of smallpox, age 40, in 1726. Other versions of the story say she died of a broken neck after falling or being pushed down the stairs, possibly the same staircase as in the picture. There is an alternative story, there is an alternative story that the report of her death from smallpox was untrue and that she actually died years later following a pretend funeral. If any of that is true, that is extreme cruelty. But as you mentioned, Lord Townshend may have had a violent temper. If people want to dig deeper, Lady Dorothy was sister of Robert Walpole, the Prime Minister. So I'm a little sceptical, as I would expect the Prime Minister would have some means of rescuing his sister from his from her imprisonment. Additionally, Lord Townshend, apparently mistreating a member of a powerful, influential, uh, powerful and influential family, probably needs further explanation. Well, we'll have to continue talking about this haunting and other famous hauntings after this short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media Day. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, 
they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were talking about the brown lady reported at Rayham Hall. So besides the photograph, have there been any sightings of a ghost in Rayham Hall? There were reported sightings of the brown lady in 19, sorry, in 1835 and 1836. The next sighting was in, in 1926 when a ghost was identified by comparing the apparition with a portrait of Lady Dorothy Townsend. There doesn't appear to be any reports of sightings since 1936. Has there been any paranormal investigation at Rayham House? I couldn't find anyone claiming to have conducted a paranormal investigation. In 1937, the Society for Psychical Research on reviewing the country life photograph concluded that the camera had been shaken during a six-second exposure to create the image. That conclusion is not consistent with the sharp relief of the staircase in the photograph. But I think it's time to move on. We have time for one more famous haunting. Can you talk about the alleged ghosts of Harry Houdini? I don't think that Harry Houdini needs much introduction for a lot of people, but here's a quote from the Smithsonian website. Harry Houdini is most often remembered as an escape artist and a, mu- and a magician. He was also an actor, an aviator, an amateur historian, and a businessman. Within each of these roles, he was an innovator and sometimes an inventor. But to protect his illusions, he largely avoided the patent process, kept secrets, copyrighted his tricks, and otherwise concealed his inventive nature, end quote. He also spent a lot of time exposing fake mediums, and as a result of being exposed to fakery when trying to contact his dead mother. In the 1920s, mediums were very popular, along with various tricks, to deceive paying customers into believing perceptions created by props were actually real. Harry Houdini died on Halloween in 1926 in Detroit, Michigan, following being punched in the abdomen in his dressing room in the Princess Theatre in Montreal, Canada. He was demonstrating that he could stand up to punching, but apparently due to a broken ankle, didn't brace himself correctly. It is not certain whether his death by a ruptured appendix was caused, aggravated or masked by the blows to his abdomen. Since 1960, since 1926, what have been the sightings of Harry's ghost? Before we go on his sightings, we should mention the arrangement he had with his friends and his wife, Bess. I will quote from the website Legacy.com. Houdini was never convinced in his lifetime that the dead could contact the living, but he vowed to continue trying to make it happen even after his death. He made a pact with several of his friends that if he could contact them from the afterlife, he would. He arranged a secret code with Bess. If the deceased Houdini found a way to contact her, he would use this code so she would know it was really him. After Harry Houdini's death on October 31st, 1926, Bess conducted many seances, attempting to create circumstances and atmospheres that would help her beloved husband contact her. Several mediums claimed to have heard from Houdini and presented messages with his code, which conveniently was included in a book published not long after his death. Evidence from their claims was shaky, so Bess continued to hold yearly seances each Halloween until 1936. That year's seance was broadcasted on the radio. When repeated begging didn't bring a message, Bess officially gave up, stating, My last hope is gone. I do not believe Houdini can come back to me or to anyone. It is finished. Good night, Harry. At that point, a violent thunderstorm broke out with torrential rains and frightening pyrotechnics. The seance participants later learned that this thunderstorm was extremely small. It was localized above the radio station and didn't affect any other areas of the city. That's interesting. In the spirit of Harry helped organize the thunderstorm, then that might suggest that he is not a ghost. The sightings of an apparent ghost that might be Harry Houdini have been in Laurel Canyon, Canyon, Los Angeles, California. The house that Harry and Bess once shared was destroyed by a brush fire in 1959. Here's the quote from Haunted Hollywood website. 
You see, some say that a ghost of Houdini does not rest in peace, and that he still walks where his beloved castle once stood. Those who have come to see the remains of the house, as many do on Halloween nights, claim to have seen a dark figure standing on the staircase or walking in the garden grotto. Many believe that the shape is that of Houdini himself. The magician always said that if it was would be possible for him to come back, he would do so, and perhaps he has. With Harry Houdini having the final word, I will ask the first question. Is it a common occurrence for ghosts to inhabit ships? Yes and no. Not more common than other places, but ships tend to have a lot of deaths and negative incidences. So wherever you have negative things occurring, ghosts are more likely to be trapped there. What happens to a ghost on board a ship that sinks or is broken up for scrap? So it really depends on the ghost. So the ghost may stay with the ship and stay and haunt the ship, ship, or the ghost may actually haunt the area of water that the ship once inhabited on. So it really depends on the individual situation. Or the ghost may just want to haunt something else that they feel more comfortable. So somewhere they they used to live might be a place they might decide to haunt. Are there more than the usual number of ghosts in the British Isles? That question's tricky since there are ghosts all over. So comparative, there are many ghosts, but not compared to some other places. Is it because there are a lot of people in the British Isles with a lot of old buildings? Correct, and the more old buildings and old burial grounds, cemeteries, etc. that exist, the more ghosts and the more tragic deaths and negativity, the more ghosts there probably will be. Aboard the Queen Mary, do dark shadows appear and ghostly apparitions visit at night? Yes. Aboard the Queen Mary, does the odour of cigar smoke flood an empty room? Yes. Do invisible children laugh in vacant halls with the spirit of a little girl playing in the first class swimming pool? Yes. Is a spectral stranger likely to appear at the end of your bed during the night? Yes and no. It depends on the person. So obviously in some experiences, the people actually there will not experience anything. But in other circumstances, the ghosts are more drawn to them. Is B-Deck the most haunted part of the ship? Yes. Did a violent murder occur in room B340? Yes. Who was murdered? A younger woman. Are there strange occurrences in room B340, such as lights turning on, bed sheets being pulled off, or an angry voice commanding to get out? Yes. Do children haunt the first-class swimming pool by giggling and taunting visitors? Yes. Who were the children? They were the children of some of the most prominent figures on the ship. Each had different tragic deaths. So a couple of them were drownings, while one was actually a very tragic accident where the children ended up accident where the child ended up accidentally hanging themselves did a five-year-old girl called jackie drown in the second class swimming pool yes does jackie's ghost visit the first class swimming pool yes who was jackie she was one of the children of obviously people on the ship she was just a normal middle-class child from a middle-class family but she also had other siblings So she had two older brothers. Is an apparition seen of a woman in 1930s swimwear? Yes. Who is she? Just a visitor that was there, and she actually died in a different way off the boat, but decided to come back and haunt the boat. Are there sounds of splashing from an empty pool? Yes. Are Are wet footprints seen around the pool? Yes. Why does the first class swimming pool have so many stories of hauntings? Because a lot of the ghosts were attracted to it, since it's a place where they know many people will visit. So it's basically a place where they know they will get attention. Why does the ship have so many ghosts? Because ships used to have a lot of unfortunate accidents happening on them. So the problem was with a lot of different ships, especially back when technology and medical care was not what it is today, it was a lot more common for people to die aboard the ships. So obviously drownings, accidental deaths, and it was harder to get medical attention since, yes, there were medical personnel on board, but not like there is today. So a lot of people passed away in ships since they could not get to shore and get the medical attention they would have been provided on shore. What exactly is a ghost? 
A ghost is a spirit that's trapped between the spirit world and the physical world. So it's a soul that ba basically passed away. So the soul's body is dead, but the soul has not crossed over into the light, into heaven or the other side. So the soul is basically trapped in this kind of in-between world where they are no longer in their physical body, they are no longer alive, but they are also still trapped in the physical world. So this usually happens in most cases because the ghost had some type of tragic death. So the ghost does not completely realize that it's passed away in a lot of cases and tries to still live its life in the physical world, not really realizing that it's no longer in its physical body. I think you've answered this for the, for the lady in the 1930s swimwear, but do ghosts have free will? Yes. A final question about the Queen Mary. Does she have a lot of ghosts because she was a large ship and she was in service for many years? That's part of the reason, yes. And again, it wasn't prepared for all the people. So one of the reasons is that they didn't prepare the ship properly for different accidents is accidents that occurred. Changing subject, were ghosts from knights and ladies dressed in ancient costumes seen by the captain of the guard at the Tower of London? Yes. Who were the ghosts? Past people who used to live there. Does a, walk, does a ghost walk between the Queen's House and the Chapel of St. Peter Ad Vincula in the Tower of London? Yes, but we'll have to continue with the questions and the psychic insight about famous hauntings after this short break. And you're listening to Too Good to Be True with Justina Marsh and Pete Marsh on the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the Exxon radio show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201 934-8986 or Skype at Elizabeth.Joyce And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork, 
will take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we are going through the questions and the psychic insight. So, Dad, can you please continue with the questions? Yes, we were asking about the ghost that was walking between the Queen's House to the Chapel of St. Peter Ad Vincula at the Tower of London. So, who was the ghost? Just someone who used to have a home there. So, they are haunting the land, not necessarily the place. So, it's based on where the land is located. In 1864, did a soldier on duty in the grounds of the Tower of London pass his bayonet through a female apparition? Yes. Who was the female? That was a female, again, that used to be in the area, but that ghost is no longer a ghost and has passed on. Was a ghost sighted standing at the window of the Dean's Cloister at Windsor Castle? That was just a shadow. Has a ghost been sighted running down a corridor in Windsor Castle, screaming and clutching its head? Yes. Has an apparition been seen at Hampton Court wearing a blue or black dress? Yes. Are any of these sightings of Anne Boleyn? No. Has Anne Boleyn's spirit passed to the other side with no ghost of Anne Boleyn? Correct. Do the reported apparitions belong to people who were not famous that lived in those locations? Correct. Changing subject, at Gettysburg, were some, of the mo- were some movie extras at Little Round Top approached by a grizzled old man in a union uniform who passed around spare ammunition? Yes. Was the ammunition from 1863 when the battle was fought? Technically, yes. So the ghost didn't bring the ammunition into the future time, but more found the ammunition. So it's not that the ghost held on to the ammunition for that time but instead found it and then gave it away at that time. Who was the old man? Basically one of the people who passed passed away. During the battle? Correct. At Salt Bridge, did a group of paranormal investigators hear sounds of neighing horses and cannon fire, which lasted for over 20 minutes? Yes, but that's not actually a ghost. So that's where things get tricky since when negative events, such as war, battles, large massacres occur, sometimes the energy is lingering. So that was energy lingering from the battle, since it was a very negative and high energy event. So it's more this energy lingering that's making the noises, sounds like the battle, compared to ghosts, which usually would not mimic horse noises or things like that. So in some of these haunted locations, it's just lingering energy, not exactly the ghosts that are actually responsible for the noises and paranormal activity. Is that an imprint? Yes. As the last cannon fired, did the fog lift? Yes. On returning returning to Soaks Bridge later, did the paranormal investigators see shadow people darting by with the sound of men's voices, as well as growling and the sounds of battle? Yes. What triggers an imprint? Does there need to be energy and perception of that energy? Yes. So an imprint is caused by a very high energy that basically builds. So, for example, on the battlefield, there's a lot of high energy, weapons, killings, and it all comes together to form. You can think of it as a massive ball of energy. And to release this massive ball of energy, there has to be the right circumstances. So when people go to visit it, not everyone's going to experience the imprint. So it's very on an individual basis. So in the case of the paranormal investigators, they're already open to hearing different noises, experiencing paranormal activity, which made it so the energy could get out of this ball and basically in a way explode out so the imprint could be let free. So these imprints can last for a very long time, or they can just happen for a short period of time, depending on the actual energy present. So once the paranormal investigators experience the imprint, did it go away? In that circumstance, they might occur again, but that's only because there was so much activity on the battlefield. So for example, let's say a murder takes place, 
and its very high energy that leaves an imprint. Only a few people might experience this imprint, and it may only occur once. So these people might never be able to experience the imprint again, and it might never be proven that this imprint existed. So it needs the right circumstances where you can think of it just like when it rains. It needs to be the right condition for it to rain, otherwise it's only going to rain once in that area. And that rain might not come back for a few weeks, a few months, even a year. So the right circumstances have to be present for the imprint to actually play. Does Gettysburg have more paranormal activity than other historical sites, including battlefields? Yes and no. So the thing with Gettysburg is that it was very high energy. So there was a lot of very high energy, nervous energy, a lot of people really not prepared. So for example, if you take a different war, let's take World War II, there would be different imprints depending on where the battlefields are. But people were more prepared for the war and knew what they were walking into. So it's the very more unexpected nature of Gettysburg, which adds the higher energy. Do unfortunate events occur to people who remove rocks from Gettysburg? No. So there are no entities possessing rocks on the battlefield? No. Changing subject, was there a ghost of a young boy captured in a photograph of the 10 women standing in two rows in the recent news article? Yes. Was the young boy drowned? Yes. Is there a ghostly presence in room four of the local hotel? Yes. Do wet footprints appear in the hallway of the hotel with a boy apparently looking for his mother? Unfortunately, yes. Is there a way to return the boy to his family, assuming they have, they have passed away? So the only thing that can be said is that it would take an expert to return the boy back home. So someone who has experience in the paranormal field. So paranormal investigator, psychic, someone who actually has the experience. Since basically a ritual would have to be performed where the boy is gui guided back to the white light, back to his family. But again, it should only be done by trained professionals since dealing with ghosts is not something that just anyone should try and conquer. Who is the boy and when did it happen? It happened about 300 years ago, so a very long time ago, and it was just a normal little boy. Changing subject, is the photograph of the brown lady of Raynham Hall real or fake? Real. Is the figure the ghost of Lady Dorothy Townsend? Yes. Was Lady Townsend imprisoned by her husband after he became enraged? Yes. Did she die of smallpox age 40 or did she die of a broken neck? A broken neck. Why have there been so few sightings of the brown lady of Raynham Hall? Since she's scared of a lot of people, so she only appears to certain people. Lady Dorothy Townsend's brother was the Prime Minister. Why was she allowed to be locked away given that she was from a prominent family? Were women just property in those days? That and that her brother did not want to look bad either. So everything was very hush-hush. So if he made a scene out of it, then he would lose a lot of respect from the other men. So her husband kept it very quiet? Yes. Is there anything we can do to help the brown lady of Raynham Hall? Just send her positive energy, and again, a professional could help her cross over. Changing the subject, why wasn't Harry Houdini successful in finding an honest medium to contact his mother? Because it wasn't set in his path, so it wasn't something that was planned out for him to meet an actual medium that actually could do the work properly. Was it on Harry Houdini's life path to pass away? In 1926? Yes. Was the thunderstorm that blew up in 1936 around the radio station where the seance was it held, influenced by the spirit of Harry Houdini? No. So it's just a random event that was a coincidence? A coincidence. Does the ghost of Harry Houdini appear at every Halloween at the site of his former home in California? No. Why are so many people fascinated with the life and death of Harry Houdini? Because he had a very interesting life and was a lot, of di lot different from most people. So a lot of people are very interested in people different from themselves. So there's no ghost of Harry Houdini that haunts anywhere? No, he's very happy on the other side. How can we help the ghosts we hear about? Just send them positive energy and realize that ghosts should be respected. So some ghosts do play tricks and like to mess with people but there also needs to be this mutual respect between the ghosts and the people. 
So it's just like another person where you need to respect them, even though they are in ghost form. What can we learn from the existence of ghosts in our world? That the real takeaway is that there are a lot of haunted locations. And a lot of the similarities are people dying in very tragic ways. So one thing that can be prevented is murders, obviously. And that is something that a society would obviously have to change, since a lot of the ghosts are actually killed in very vicious ways by other people. And for those accidental incidents, there's basically, again, going back to the respect part of respecting the ghosts. Also, that there are ghosts that do exist, but there's also investigators that help these ghosts. So there's something very positive that these, the people that are obviously the real investigators, really trained in the paranormal world, can actually help these ghosts. So it's good to support people that are actually doing the real work, since some people are really trying to help in a positive way. And they're not just out there to make money or get fame, but are truly trying to help the ghosts. That was the last answer. Is the idea that ghosts are spirits that haven't passed over to the other side too good to be true? That depends on what you are prepared to believe. So there we are. That was a lot of information. Um, do you want to talk about our Facebook site, honey? Yeah. So we have a Facebook page that's called Too Good to Be True. And you can type that in, find us. And the first two is spelled T-W-O. So Too Good to Be True. And you can go on there, you can like us, you can follow us, and you can interact with us. So if you want to send us a message, comment on the posts, and if you have any suggestions, you can either comment on one of the posts with your suggestion, or you can private message. And we still are doing shout-outs. So for anyone who wants their name shouted out in the show, you can either message us right on the post, and we would love to interact with the listeners. So as always, thank you all the listeners and we look forward to you listening to next week's show Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. 
You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.